Hello, and thank you for joining us for Nonprofit HR's virtual learning education event. This session is entitled Aligning Your Organization's DEI Strategy and Priorities with Your Executive and Professional Searches. My name is Atokatha Ashman Brew, and I am Managing Director of Marketing and Strategic Communication for Nonprofit HR. Just a little about Nonprofit HR before we get started. Since 2000, Nonprofit HR remains the country's leading and oldest firm focused exclusively on the talent management needs of the social sector, including nonprofits, associations, social enterprises, and other mission-driven organizations. We focus on consulting efforts that cover the following areas. Strategy and advisory, HR outsourcing, total rewards, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and search. Nonprofit HR was founded with one goal in mind, to strengthen the social sector's talent management capacity by strengthening its people. Today's conversation will be led by Myra Briggs, Managing Director Director for Impact Search Advisors. Myra will be joined by a panel of consultants who are experts in talent management and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now, a little about Myra Briggs. Myra serves as Managing Director for Impact Search Advisors and brings over 18 years experience in executive and professional search and leadership development. She is responsible for the strategy and guidance of the firm's search practice, including building and leading a team of executive and professional level search and research consultants responsible for engaging in client-facing work nationally. About Angela Saunders. Angela Saunders works with Nonprofit HR's diversity, equity, and inclusion team to facilitate DEI training solutions and assessment services for nonprofits and social sector clients. Angela is passionate about DEI work and co-leads Nonprofit HR's DEI advisory team, which is tasked with guiding leadership on internal DEI matters and developing the strategic plan to establish the foundation and direction of the firm's DEI efforts. About Brian Jackson. Brian provides subject matter expert advice, insight, and strategic direction to clients. He oversees complex client engagements, manages projects to completion, and designs and facilitates DEI's training solutions and assessment services to partners and stakeholders. As a passionate trainer and driven operations and people leader, Brian has worked with the Washington Nationals baseball team, Arlington Public Library System, and the Alexandria Department of Human Services. About Michael McElroy. Michael has over 14 years of experience working in the nonprofit sector as a people and program manager. He has worked in a wide variety of HR functions, including full life cycle recruiting, onboarding, training, employee engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and employee assessment. And on to Sophia LaFontante. As a consultant on our search team, Sophia finds the best and brightest candidates to fulfill employment opportunities for nonprofit HR clients. She is passionate about the professional development of new candidates and the growth of nonprofit HR's search practice. On to you now, Angela, to share a little about nonprofit HR's DEI practice. Thank you, Atokatha. So among the core values of nonprofit HR are to be inclusive, authentic, and accountable. And so we live these values through our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. This is a commitment that extends not only to nonprofit HR employees, but also to the social impact sector that we serve. Our DEI practice area focuses on thought partnering with social impact organizations to create equitable, inclusive workplaces. And we do this by conducting comprehensive equity assessments, devising strategies and roadmaps to prioritize DEI based on the assessment findings, and providing customized training, facilitation, and coaching in racial justice-centered topics. I'm gonna to turn it over to Myra to talk to you about the search practice. Thanks, Angela. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today, and you'll be hearing my voice a lot because I'll be moderating the remainder of the conversation. But before we get into that, just want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about Impact Search Advisors, which is the client-facing talent acquisition arm of nonprofit HR. Uh, some of the services that we cover under Impact Search Advisors are executive search, professional search, recruitment outsourcing, and interim leadership. Our process is bespoke and comprehensive, which are not usually two words that you hear together, but we're able to 
to accomplish that for our clients by really digging in and learning not only about your mission, but what you hope to accomplish through that mission with the, with the candidates that we select and ultimately the staff that you bring on through your organization. Before we get started with the conversation, though, I really did want to spend some time to qualify our uh, capabilities in even discussing this topic. Uh, through Impact Search Advisors and along with and in partnership with our diversity, equity, and inclusion practice, we have achieved monumental success is what I'll call it in the area of moving the needle for diverse leadership as well as diversity recruiting throughout the nonprofit sector. What we have on the screen here are numbers that we're very proud of through January of 2020 showcasing the demographics by gender, race, and ethnicity of executives and professionals hired through the client-facing work at Nonprofit HR and through Impact Search Advisors. As you can see, we are not only intentional, but successful behind that intention and really being able to drive forward the missions of not only our clients, but also assisting them with developing those strategies around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and ensuring that they're able to realize those strategies and their commitment to those strategies through their people and through their talent acquisition programs. And so before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about how we'll interact with one another to undergird what Atoka has already said. We will be taking questions throughout the, the time together. So if you want to pop them into the questions pane as you have them, uh, we will pause periodically throughout the course of the presentation to answer some of those questions. I'm joined by four fantastic experts and not only diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also talent management and recruiting. So we've also been able to record a number of the questions that you sent over ahead of the conversation today, and we'll also be covering some of those. Uh, so before we get started, we'll just lay out the landscape of the conversation today because we're going to cover four general areas. First, we're going to talk about how to align your DEI strategy with your upcoming searches for executive and professional level talent. This is something that many of our clients are calling upon us to do, whether they reach out to us for search first or they reach out to us for DEI first. Eventually, those two end up crossing one another. So we figured we'd start right there and tackle the topic of how do we align those two strategies. Really excited about sharing our concepts with you there. Then we'll move on to talking about keywords ways to identify and minimize bias from your talent attraction strategy through employee offboarding. I know you guys were probably really along, really with me until we got to the word offboarding because we normally talk about onboarding and how do we welcome those new employees. But we're going to really drive the point home for you, how you can connect your employer brand, as well as setting yourself up for success for future hires by paying just as much attention to the offboarding of staff as you do to the onboarding of staff and really making sure that that process is equitable. Then we're gonna move on and talk a little bit about why it is necessary to audit your organization's compensation, feedback and performance management structures to address any inequities, which is something that not only the members of these teams can help you with, but also as Atokatha mentioned, we do have a total rewards practice that is absolutely prepared and um, qualified to assist assist you with auditing these things, and we'll talk a little bit about how you should approach that, that process. And finally, we'll give you some essential tips and tricks on how to create a culture of belonging that aligns with your commitment to DEI and career campaigns. Recently, we've all seen the B added to the end of DEI, and that B stands for belonging, which is just as important as the other three components of the term that have become so popular and known to all of us that are working on talent management strategies. And it's vitally important that we ensure that our teams, as well as the members of our leadership teams, also feel that they belong. And we'll talk to you a little bit about ensuring that and aligning that with our career campaigns as well. So without further ado, I think we'll get started with our conversation and jump right into our first topic. We're going to talk about, before we get to that though, I do want to kind of force interaction just a little bit. And in doing so, what Atokatha will be doing is putting in a question at the top of each part that we would like for you all to respond to in the questions pane. So the first question that she's gonna put up here is what is your organization doing to align their DEI and talent strategies? So right in the questions pane, you can type your answer there and we'll cover some of those and I'll, I'll touch on them. We may even discuss a few that we think that others would wanna 
talk about a little bit deeper as we're going on. But while we're waiting for that, I'm just going to jump right in and call on my good friend, Angela. What strategies can an organization use to interrupt bias in their talent acquisition process? So I would say it's first important to start with the job ad. And so the job ad language can be enhanced by ensuring that you include a commitment to diversity statement. You want that kind of language. Most job ads have EEO um, statements, but that's sort of the legalistic speak. And so you want to have a commitment to diversity that really just invites your candidates in to want to be a part of your organization because they see that you're inclusive. You can use resources like Gender Decoder to help help you avoid um, excluding particular genders. It's also important to avoid specific words that might be off-putting in your job ad. So you don't want to say things like native English speaker only or legal citizens only. Those kinds of things are exclusionary to a lot of candidates. You also want to be thoughtful about where you're placing your job ads and make sure that you're including job boards that target candidates across the various dimensions of diversity, which would include your race, disability, age, sexual orientation, or your veteran status. Set a minimum number of candidates from diverse backgrounds that you want to have interviewed. So, for example, maybe have 20 percent of your applicants be from underrepresented groups and then pause that recruitment process if you feel like you're not getting there. And then you're going to try to cast a wider net in instances where that minimum is not met. And then finally, when you're reviewing resumes, take a blind review approach. And so when you remove those things like people's names, where they live, et cetera, that allows you to screen candidates on their readiness to take on the role without having any knowledge of their names or other factors that may unfairly influence the evaluation of their resume. So it's really important that you keep those bias interrupters as in mind as you go through this process. Thanks so much for that, Angela. And I did pop the link for the gender decoder um, in our organizer chat, which Atokatha will share with the group. It's a fantastic tool. And when we're talking about tools and resources, you know, we had a lot of questions about job ads and where things can be posted to attract or to even just get in front of uh, the, the diverse candidates in a diverse audience, you know, stepping outside of the box from your Indeed, LinkedIn, CEO update in some of the places that are more mainstream. Um, and I want to call on Sophia, not just to talk about the job posting sites, because Sophia is our resident distribution list expert. I mean, so Sophia has done so much work around developing lists that will not only uh, promote diversity, but a number of other niche areas as well. So Sophia, I'm not going to pigeonhole you into your response, but just please make sure you include some of those posting sites in your response. But as we're talking, could you talk a little bit more about how organizations can be proactive in their approach to interrupt some of these biases? Absolutely. Um, I definitely want to piggyback on what Angela was saying and including those groups. Those are very important. Um, a couple examples of groups to share um, for those who are thinking, oh, wow, I have to spend money. That's not always the case. There are a ton of Google groups that specifically focused um, on certain groups. So we have Black Beltway, which would be an African-American um, Google group for those that are in the DMV area. You also have an organization um, called Jobs That Are Left that is a Google group. So these are free options. Jobs That Are Left is literally those who are more liberal leaning. So you kind of know that you're going to get a good cluster of those individuals that might also be a part of the LGBTIQA and others. Um, you also have groups like Green Latinos, which is focusing on those who are environmental friendly and Latinx. So you also want to think about the fact that some of these job boards not just focus on minorities, but also focus on individuals that have certain skills. Um, so it's important when we're looking for jobs to pinpoint the skills we're looking for. And then we also have another job board that is called Inclusive. And inclusive is for all um, individuals who are in professionals that are persons of color um, of the global majority that are not in the tech business. So again, oftentimes you will see a lot more tech driven um, job boards and groups. And sometimes that's not you know, what you're looking for. So you wanna definitely make sure that you're looking in a way where you're not just finding individuals, but also looking for the skills that you um, want. But another way to be proactive in the approach, aside from job description and um, avoiding certain languages, what Angela discussed, 
I would also say is be open to how your interview techniques and how you're reaching out to candidates. Know that not everyone is going to be comfortable in the same way. There are different platforms for recording. There are different platforms for text and how you reach out to individuals because we also want to think about time, keeping candidates excited and interested in the role um, and response is important. I always like to share an example of interviewing with someone who might have diverse abilities and knowing that that person can still do the role and that they're ways of interviewing techniques may be different. I've interviewed individuals who have requested the length of time for each question um, because they wanted to set a timer because that is how they measure themselves and um, feel as though they're doing well. And then in addition to that said, they needed everything to be written down in order for them to answer it. So I told them, not a problem. I will email you the questions in advance um, literally at that moment, not like the day before, not to give anyone an advantage over a person or if we're in Zoom, like we are right now in a virtual um, space, I can put it in the chat for you so you don't have to sit and write down what you hear me say. So also leave yourself to being open to interviewing people differently and know that they'll be able to show up if you provide them the circumstances that make them feel safe and comfortable. Thank you for that, Sophia. So, you know, one of the things that I love is a good case study and everyone is looking for examples, examples. Show me someone that's done this before. So, Michael, you have done not only many searches within the search practice and recruitment outsourcing, but also in other areas of client facing work. And I'd love just to hear from you. In what ways have you actually seen your clients align these two strategies as they are embarking upon searches? Sure. Thanks, Myra. Yeah, a, a few thoughts about this. I mean, one, one thing I just want to say in general about strategy is um, whether it's for your recruiting or just any strategy related to DEI is remembering that the business case for it, that in addition to being the right thing to do, it is also um, proven, it's scientifically proven that well-managed diverse teams um, are more productive uh, than homogenous ones. I think there was a study that McKinsey did uh, a few years ago uh, saying that well-managed diverse teams were 35% more pro, uh, pro profitable um, than homogenous ones, and that applies to uh, the nonprofit space as well as the for-profit space. Um, so when it comes to the search itself, we've talked about some of this. Um, one thing I'm having organizations do is really looking at the documents that they've been that have just been in circulation for so long. We we're talking about this a little bit about using some of that coded language that shows up in uh, in interview documents and job descriptions, the, you know, so pay attention to that job description that maybe you created 10 years ago and that's been getting gradually refreshed over the years. And language like his or hers, for example, may have been perfectly appropriate 10 years ago and isn't now. Um, thinking about professionalism, what does professionalism actually mean? Uh, professionalism is an individual's very specific interpretation <laughs> of what um, what a qualified professional may be, um, and then also. Cultural fit is another one I think about a lot. Yeah. A culture shouldn't be stagnant. Um, a culture should be constantly evolving and growing and changing. Uh, you know, if we were, we'd all be working for what is the Sterling Cooper Price Manning, whatever the Mad Men firm was. Uh, sure. You know, if, if uh, culture never changed and evolved. So these are the kinds of things to be paying attention to and kind of lean into the change. Um, then there's some of the barriers and obstacles. So that's what I look at when I look when I work with clients. I look at where are their barriers um, in their hiring process. Um, I was a theater major. That is not particularly related to my work. Maybe a little bit in this exact moment, but not particularly related to my to my daily work. Um, that was 15 years ago. I've had a whole life since then. And I'd hope that I'd be evaluated on the totality of my work, not just some decisions I made when I was 16 to 24 years old. Um, I also used to work uh, for an organization that worked primarily with uh, young people facing adversity, uh, many of whom weren't necessarily on the college trajectory. And so, but our organization had a requirement that our staff um, had a specific degree. So, you know, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Why would, I mean, who would it make more sense to hire as a coordinator for, uh, for mentees? Someone who went to some liberal arts college across the country or someone who's from the community that the mentees live in um, and who maybe was a participant in the program themselves. So really taking a look at the practices that may be ingrained and challenging all of them throughout every step of the process, whether it's interviews, resume reviews, um, any, any of the practices that you have um, in your recruiting process. 
Thank you so much for that, Michael. You know, and that's something that we're beginning to see more and more, uh, specifically the last example that you gave, where whether it be in professional level roles or executive leadership positions, organizations are really beginning to see that the key to mission sustainability, which is what everyone's thinking about right now, I mean, COVID has forced us into really solidifying the sustainability of our organizations and thereby the missions that we serve, and really looking at mission sustainability through the lens of really being able to align the background of the executive leadership team and those who are actually doing the work of the organization with the backgrounds of the constituents that the organization serve and really being able to, like you said at the top of your comments, making the business case for connecting the two is, uh, is a really great point to make. So Brian, you and Angela are our survey people, our assessments and training and development folks. And, and I know that when you all are beginning this work with clients, one of the key elements is gauging their readiness because then we have to really see where are we going to start. Tell us a little bit about how you are how you gauge an organization's readiness for this work. And for an organization that's just starting, where do they start, right? We're just starting out on our journey. How do we relay that and, and all of that? Absolutely. Thank you, Myra. Well, the first thing is before you even start on your DEI cultural journey, you have to ask yourself some basic questions as an organization. And even if you are an organization that's on a race equity DEI journey, it is always good to look into what you've done thus far to get to where you currently are and identify where you wanna go. And revisiting is the best way to have a game plan on moving forward. And you have a lot of internal in-house um, key stakeholders that can provide you with some essential information. So do a readiness assessment with HR. Do also this same readiness assessment with senior leadership, acquire your board, engage with them, and then also talk to your staff. Um, when posting, you have to make sure that you have a broad range of where you are posting some of this information. You just can't let the work do the work for you. LinkedIn can only go so far, but what right. relationships are you establishing with HBCUs, with some of our indigenous brothers and sisters that are out there that have organizations? Um, as well as how are you developing a pipeline of talent? Imagine what this would look like for your organization if you have a pipeline of talent and you don't have to revisit this every year because you know that two to 10 folks are going to be coming in and out of your door. The other piece too, and I think that this often gets lost, but this is essential. And that is, do you have a mentoring practice? Now, it goes above and beyond just putting a person that is a senior in front of someone that is not. You have to have someone that has cultural competence a way that you would communicate or converse with someone that identifies as the LGBTQIA+, and that's not what you are, you could be the tie that binds and have them want to stay long-term or the tie that breaks and for them to be looking for a role when they're currently in a role. Mm -hmm. And so you also want to ask yourself too, do you have money devoted to this practice? Now, we're not talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. $100 can go a very long way. Okay. And it has to be it has to be real money. And it can't be that that what I, what I call that fake money and that it's all good because our board knows we have it out facing folks know we have it. But when it comes time to access it, we don't have it anymore. Right. And so you want to make sure that when you commit to this work, you know that this is a journey where I often will say the best step in this journey is the first step. But from there, you have to be willing to continue to walk the path and be open to what will be shared with you, as well as once people know that this is the journey that you are on, you will have committed people, committed people in-house that will be willing to do some of the work for you and with you. Thank you for that, Brian. Before we move on to our next topic, we'd love to see the answers to our initial question, uh, what is your organization doing to align their DEI and talent strategies? Uh, are we ready for some of those answers? Yeah, Myra, quite a few things came in. I'll just read off a few of them. Uh, someone said planning to incorporate it in the strategic planning process. Nice. Someone said ensuring diverse hiring pools, minimize bias in the hiring process, ensuring reviewing all processes with an equity lens, uh, someone else shared engaging a consultant to guide us through the DE&I program design and implementation. 
Awesome. Someone said our EIB and HR have a shared strategy and we will meet on a weekly basis to move forward with our work. And another person said, we've started incorporating our DEI initiatives in our postings and included those videos from employees on our careers page. So those are several things that were shared amongst many other, uh, among many other posts. That's wonderful. I heard a lot about aligning the strategies and making sure that we're meeting regularly, which is fantastic. I also heard a lot in there about employer branding, right? Really letting that commitment be known, which is so very important when, when really trying to not only align the strategies, but to achieve the goals around diversity, equity, and inclusion as it pertains to that talent strategy. So I won't spend too much time because I'm sure we could make an entire conversation out of any one of these topics, but want to make sure that we're able to give each equal time to each. And so before we move on, we'll get our second question for the audience posted, which is what does your organization do to support a quote unquote soft landing for offboarded staff? Uh, and so if you want to go ahead and put your answers to that question in the questions pane. Um, and it's okay if you haven't done anything. So if you haven't done anything, then I'm expecting some questions to pop up in the questions pane about how you can actually do that. And while we're getting the, gathering that insight from you all, I'm going to kick it off to Brian to start us off this time. And Brian, can you just share with the group why offboarding is as important or as equally important as onboarding? Absolutely. Thank you, Myra. And, and you said it, it is just as important, if not more important, because you are engaging with someone that has institutional knowledge. When we often onboard, they're coming in with an idea of the organization. As someone is departing, they are able to speak to policies, procedures, relationships, culture. But what is essential and what is key is how comfortable and safe in that space do they feel to disseminate that information? The worst thing that can happen is to have someone that has institutional knowledge, knowledge to disrupt some of the bias procedures that may be going on within an organization, but they don't feel safe in being able to share that information. And so what then leaves is this information that could be beneficial into disrupting some of these inequities. The other aspect of offboarding that is essential is that you just need to listen. A lot of things can be shared with nuances and how safe is the space for someone to articulate authenticity. And if there is something that is not being said as a practitioner of being able to, to receive that information, you have to be able to take some of the nuances to say, you know what, they may not have specifically said gender inequality, but there is something that I need to make sure that I highlight so that this isn't something that continues moving forward. So. That's what I would say. Always see the offboarding process as just as essential as folks coming in. Absolutely. And I think that listening thing is so very important. My grandmother always said, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, <laughs> right? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, so yes. Listen twice as much as you talk. And yeah. I think that we can definitely apply that to the offboarding policy because, you know, like you said, institutional knowledge, just all of the mm -hmm. things that you know, someone may not have been comfortable saying, knowing that they have to come back to this place tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and really mm -hmm. capitalizing on that that really unique opportunity. Um, so let's take a little bit more time talking about the offboarding process and how it might influence an organization's DEI strategy. Angela, can you talk us through some of the, the ways that that offboarding process might influence the strategy? Absolutely. And so when you're having um, an offboarding process, in order for it to be effective, it needs to be a mechanism that allows you to get honest, constructive feedback on the employment experience. Um, we want information like how equitable inclus or inclusive did the exiting employee feel that the employer was. And so the best way to do that is to add questions to your exit interview. You want to be intentional about gauging exiting employees' feelings of belonging. So you want to ask things like, did you feel comfortable bringing your authentic whole self to work? Did you feel like you belonged at this organization? 
And you could also be more direct in your questions about fair treatment. So you want to think about things like, did you feel that you were treated fairly by your supervisor? And so these kinds of targeted questions will help you to get a feel for the perceptions of the workplace, equity and inclusion. And then you have to act on that information that you've received. Like once you listen, you want to make sure that you're continually focusing on DEI to make sure that it's a workplace where people want to be. Um, and not just getting this information when people are exiting. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Angela. And so, you know, I always, I, I'm a certified Six Sigma Green Belt, and one of the bases of change management is getting that executive sponsor because everybody wants to know what happens if <laughs> we don't comply with the new policy, if we do not modify based upon the new process. And Sophia, I'd love for you to spend some time talking about, you know, how can offboarding positively or negatively affect in an, an organization's employer brand? Because that's that's one of the things that even before we get to the point of a DEI strategy, people understand we wanna make sure that we're seen and viewed positively in the marketplace, but we know wherever there's a positive, there's potential for the negative. So share with us some of the ways that that offboarding process can positively or negatively affect. Um, so the way I see it is your employee brand um, directly contributes to the longevity of your organization, be it in retention or in the interested applicants that decide to apply to your role. Um, an employee who leaves on good terms, they still left. So we have to consider that, did they leave for something better? Were they leaving for work-life balance? Were they leaving for salary? Were they leaving for cultural? Or were they leaving for technology issues? Literally feeling like, you know, my job could be faster and more efficient if we use a different system for something. Um, so recognize that even someone who leaves on good terms will have valuable information to give you that can open up your employee brand and make your organization um, more appealing to interested applicants, different generations of individuals applying, different groups of individuals and different cultures um, wanting to work at your organization. And then, of course, we have to remember that if someone leaves on negative terms, there are outlets for them to be able to discuss exactly what it was that left them in dismay. If their on offboarding process is not a great process, that allows them to answer questions such as what Angela said. You can end up with um, negative reviews on things like Glassdoor um, within Facebook groups or other Google groups um, that we just discussed where people are actually posting jobs. They People are able, that are a part of these groups are able to leave a comment below the posting of the job and say, hey, I just left this, this place and that job might not be the best fit for this reason. So we have to remember that the offboarding process also gives you that opportunity, may it just be 30 minutes, to kind of clean up, make some promises so that this person still walks away from the organization but does not walk away from the organization with the intention of leaving a bad word of mouth out there in the ether. That's, that's great, Sophia. You know, I would encourage everyone on the call if you, A, have never checked your organization's Indeed or Glassdoor review, or B, have not checked it in a while, that your homework assignment for today is to go out into the fullness of the internet and see what those that are currently or have been previously at your organization have to say about your organization. You can validate the truth of what's out there, you know, it's it, but you need to know, you need the information. And in my mind, that is employer branding 101, right? To really just being able to see what's out there about your organization. It's, it's just good information to have and potentially a good place for you to start around realigning what your internal commitments are with what your organization, how your organization is viewed in the marketplace. All right, Michael, let's talk about some horror stories that you may have heard. You know, one of the things we love about working in this consulting environment, it's like a pressure cooker for experiences, right? In that we're working with our full portfolio of clients. So we have so many opportunities to collect stories and conduct case studies. So Michael, I'm sorry, tell us something about a horror story that you may have seen or heard about a candidate's offboarding experience from an organization. Sure. Well, well, so fortunately, many savvy applicants don't bash their former employer during the interview. But if you've been a part of enough interviews, you can often intuit and read between the lines a little bit. So I certainly try and do that when I'm interviewing candidates. Um, 
You know, there are a few things I was thinking about. One, this past year has been inconsistent work from home policies. I mean, that has just, you know, I get it from an organizational standpoint. It's been all, almost impossible to know what to do. And in nonprofit HR, we have some resources and thoughts and surveys that we've done about uh, return to workplace and work from home, virtual workplace. But um, organizations having shifting targets. And so employees never feel moored and never feel settled and never feel like they know what their plan is going to be. So that's been a big theme with employees um, sharing kind of why they're leaving organizations. Um, there's also, I think, an uptick in candidates who are leaving jobs pretty soon after they start. I mean, there's a there's some generational uh, differences there, but also I think in the past year and a half, um, you know, there's there's this concept of the realistic job preview uh, in recruiting, which is um, being a being a positive, uh, you know, force for what your your job is, be, but also being realistic about it and not not sugarcoating it. And as it ties to DEI, uh, you know, that really can be transparent uh, about an inclusive workspace. So it's one thing to just hire your way out of a problem. It's another thing to truly have an inclusive workspace. And your your candidates, your diverse candidates will know as soon as they're in the door and they're actually working there every day, they'll see through whatever you know, facade there may have been early on uh, during the hiring process once they're actually at the organization. So that's a reason why a lot of people have left. Um, one other thing that I hear or intuit sometimes uh, during conversations with candidates is uh, that an employer has taken their decision to leave personally um, or to look for other jobs personally. Um, and like Sophia was saying, this all circles back to employer brand and employer reputation. That, that you know, if, if you, if your CEO or whoever your your manager stops speaking to you after you share that you're going to leave an organization, that's going to show up on the glass door for an organization. And in addition to that, there these your employees all talk to each other, and so um, you may have a culture problem and an engagement problem uh, with your employees if they're leaving, and it may undo many years of positive work relationship if they leave with a somewhat uh, bitter taste uh, at the very end of their employment. Um, one quick sidebar um, is just, just a, a little tangent I want to throw out there is a lot of employees have been laid off this year. This has been a really hard year for everyone. So I just want to put a little plug in there is challenge your, your thoughts about and your, no, your preconceived notions about what someone who is laid off, what that means. Because there are a lot of really highly qualified employees who've been laid off this um, past year and a half um, because of you know, perfectly legitimate reasons. So I just, I just want to make a plug for that so I don't forget at some point uh, today. Anyone else have any horror stories that, you know, are related to uh, offboarding or that they've heard throughout their travels? Brian, I think you had something you wanted to share. <laughs> and I know you didn't think I was going to let you get off. Right? <laughs> I was about to curve it like the Matrix, but you, you called me out. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll just make it make it very short. And that is make sure that as an organization, if someone decides to leave, that this information doesn't become public. There was a story that I was very uh, that I was privy to um, by someone that I know was in a restaurant and there were high booths, so you couldn't see the person on either side, but the person on one side recognized the voice and heard the story of a person that had just been let go. And so in the future, when that person was leaving the organization, they had no trust in being able to share their authentic story with that particular person. And so not necessarily a horror story, more so of you don't know what you don't know, but don't share what you don't have to share. That's and right. again, it, it's not personal. And I love what Michael said in that things are changing, right? We are not our parents' generation staying somewhere for 30, 40 years. However, if people do leave, nine times out of 10, it is for the better. And you have to embrace that growth. You have to embrace that change. And you have to embrace the fact that they spend a time with you. And that's valuable time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just to further dig into what Michael said, I absolutely love the concept of you can't hire your way out of the problem. Because eventually, there, the, 
something happens in the marketplace in the ether where people begin to recognize, hey, they're hiring for an HR director again, you know, and people begin to, we hear that in our conversations with candidates and they'll say, I saw this job posted six months ago. So what happened with that? And candidates, and, it, and keep in mind, let me quantify that and qualify that, that the candidates that you want to hire, the consummate professionals, as we call them, or the folks that are really going to be a positive add to your organization, they are going to be asking these questions. Why are they hiring their third finance director in two years? Is it because of growth or is this the same position that we're hiring over and over again? And just to pick it back off another point that was made, you're absolutely correct. This is a unique environment in which there are a number of people who are currently not working that are not, and it's not their fault that they're not working, whether they were laid off, positions were eliminated or whatever the case may be. And as you are considering potential potential rifts or anything like that, do consider researching some outplacement services that might be available, which would actually be a counselor who can assist those employees who, if you could keep them, you definitely would want to, or even some people who you don't want to keep. And you're just saying, you know, for employer branding or for the sheer humanity of the work that our organization does, we want to promote them onto their next opportunity as opposed to just letting them go and being able to fend for themselves. Everyone that's at your organization that stands to reason has made one contribution or another, even if they just highlight deficiencies in your recruitment process. It was a lesson that you needed to learn. And so as a result of that, considering outplacement services for anyone who's leaving your organization is another tangible way that you can really help to solidify and create that soft landing. Um, I do want to pause here, Atokatha, and see if we had any questions or uh, any answers to our question at this point that we want to cover before we move into the second half of our presentation. Yes, we did have some responses to the last question. Um, I'll read a couple of them, and then we had a couple questions that I thought you might want to hear. Um, sure. The first one is, in terms of the responses, we let departing employees know that we love boomerang employees and would welcome them back with open arms. Another person said, we encourage boomerangs and give examples of folks coming back to us. One person said, I ask employees to be candid and that information, and, and I confirm with them that information will not be shared until they have left the company. And even then, I'm sure that this person was saying that they would work to make sure some information is anonymous. Um, another comment was, we try to keep them connected to the organization, exit conversation, uh, severance, career coaching, um, layoffs, et cetera, for soft terminations, and ability to file a complaint if needed. We want an ex-employee to still be a brand ambassador. And there were two questions that um, were posted. One was um, a request to share a bit more about stay interviews. And another one was asking to dig a little bit deeper on what this concept of a soft onboarding really means. A soft offboarding or a soft on, a soft offboarding. offboarding. Okay. Who wants to ta uh, tackle stay interviews? Anyone? I'll I'll kick it off and then maybe it'll it'll prompt some additional responses. Stay interviews are the biggest way to combat exit interviews, right? Mm -hmm. um, your stay, if you're not conducting stay interviews, you will 100% be conducting exit interviews at some point. Um, we love stay interviews because of the first thing that it does is it really forces you to conduct the exercise of identifying the high performers within your organization. And once you have identified those high performers, and that could be everyone, and, it, and we would love for it to be everyone. And whether or not it is, it's really a matter of checking in to make sure that you are doing your part as the employer to deserve for them to stay, quite honestly. It puts you in the position of hearing the information. But one thing that I always say, do not ask a question that you are not prepared to actually respond to the response to. Meaning that if you are asking questions around compensation, if you're asking questions around structure, if you're asking questions about reporting, uh, in, in uh, relationships. Do not ask that question if you are not prepared to change it based upon the answer that you receive. That that's something that will most assuredly minimize the trust that your staff have in the process of those state interviews. So as you're conducting them, the one piece of advice that I would give is number one, don't be afraid to ask hard questions. But, and when I say hard questions, I'm talking about things like, 
Tell me about the day that you showed up here and no longer wanted to work here, right? Tell me about a time when you actually, in the middle of the day, pulled up LinkedIn and started looking at what else was out here. What caused you to do that? Tell me about a staff meeting where you left and you really felt like, boy, we are missing the mark. And those are some of the questions that are really going to help drive you toward what can we do to realign culture, realign strategy, realign the way that we're interacting with our teams to make sure that we are encouraging them to stay. Um, and, and, and I think that those stay interviews are absolutely essential. They don't have to be super formal, but you should definitely be having them. Anyone have anything to add? Michael? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as this relates to recruitment and hiring, um, and I don't have a flashy, catchy name for this, so maybe I need to find one or come up Point with one, on. but there's also, yeah, <laughs> there's also um, gathering feedback from your recent hires. Um, no better way to get, um, you know, learn how to improve your hiring process than to connect with the people who just went through it. So that's definitely a practice I would implement with some degree of regularity every time you go through a hiring cycle is connect, whether it's individually or in small groups, with people you've hired and get their feedback um, about their experiences so you can really understand it from the uh, candidate's end as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Angela? Uh -huh. Yes, and I would just add that um, you're right. It's a it's a great employee retention tool. And some of those very same questions that you would ask on an in exit interview, you can ask when they're staying. Do you feel like you belong? Do you feel like you can bring your authentic self? Are you being treated fairly? So you can ask that same those same questions and get that honest, constructive feedback. And as you said, Myra, be prepared to act on that. Because if people are sharing with you, yes, I'm staying, but you still have some cultural challenges, then you need to be prepared to shift the dynamic that's going on in your organization. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Any tips for that soft offboarding that we want to share as a team? Are those outplacement services, um, I, I can't think of a better way to soften the blow of an involuntary offboarding. You know, when someone is being let go from an organization, but you're letting them know, we've set you up with someone who will actually assist you in finding your next opportunity. Um, it, it really does show that you care. Uh, it also relieves a bit of that anxiety from someone going into an uncertain, an uncertain job market, especially when they were not planning to previously. Anything else to add, anyone? I would say that it would be nice if supervisors would voluntarily t say to the person, if you ever need like a reference letter or a reference check, because I feel like there are so many people who leave an organization and they're kind of unsure of whether or not their supervisor or colleagues or anyone would say anything because if you're not doing the say um the the say um interviews if you're not constantly talking to your employee about their work except when it's time for the annual review at this point i only from an employee perspective i only know how you feel about me when you're evaluating everything that i've done for the year and it's important to just kind of let a person know like i am here to still support you after this um and so i think that that would also be a nice way to kind of let the offboarding process be a soft landing. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. Well, we'll move on and get some more questions uh, as we are continuing the conversation, but let's move on to this aligning and addressing any inequities with the organization's compensation and why it's necessary to audit your organization's compensation feedback and performance management structures to address any inequities. Um, Angela, what would you say are some of the dangers of an organization being becoming complacent in this area? So I feel like this goes without saying, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Say it. <laughs> we never, ever, ever want employers to become complacent with inequity, right? So from a practical standpoint, just treating employees equitably in compensation and performance management practices, it's just simply the right thing to do. But also important is that equitable practice practices can mitigate risk. So we're seeing more and more pay equity legislation at both the state and federal levels. And so it'll be important for the organizations to identify and eliminate those pay inequities as a matter of compliance, but also to avoid litigation. So you have risk mitigation um, at the forefront there. In terms of the impact on the bottom line, pay equity engenders loyalty to the employer, 
along with increased efficiency, creativity, and productivity. And so this is one of those things that's going to be part of your employment brand. So when the employment brand reflects an intentionality around pay equity, you can attract the best employees and you can also reduce your turnover. As it relates to performance management, complacency with inequity can result in diminished employee engagement. You're likely to see turnover at a minimum and, or that employees are disengaged. And so your productivity may decline as a result of that. You'll have lowered morale. And then it's just difficult for you all to make the right um, talent management decisions in terms of promotions or pay increases or things like that, because you, you, you're not doing the performance management in a way that is equitable. And then those relationships are challenged because of perceived biases. So don't be complacent. No, no. There is no, there is no growth in complacency, right? <laughs> and, I, and I forgot to put our next question for the audience up, but we'll catch up now. Um, the question that we'd like for you all to respond to is when is the last time your organization audited their compensation structure? So Tokatha will pop that there and you can respond in the questions and then we'll move on to the next part of this process. So obviously complacency is not the answer. So we've got to do an audit. Um, Brian, how would you suggest an organization approach this type of audit? We we'll often say that audits are a gift and employees are the eyes and the heart of an organization, but audits are the pulse. And it provides you with the essential tool to know that you have to act. There's nothing worse than getting some information and doing nothing with it. And so once you start to get that information, remember that this is an opportunity to learn. And what it does is it takes a bookend of, again, where you started and where you are trying to go. And so audits are an opportunity to identify gaps and then mobilize and engage for opportunities. And remember, this is not personal. As organizations, you have people that are um, the, again, it's the, it's, it's, talent and you want to make sure that you are engaging with them so that you keep talent you attract more talent and that as talent leaves they are only able to share stories of their positive experience based on acting with what was revealed with the audit thank you for that brian and and i know we have a broad diversity of participants on the call from small organizations to large how would you say that an organization would decide, do they have the internal capacity to conduct the audit or if they potentially need to engage a partner to, to, to conduct that audit? Well, I would say it depends on the organization, right? It depends on a number of things. It depends on your budget, right? It depends on what you, are, what you want to look for. It also depends on what information you are able to um, received from HR. Like a lot of these different aspects of what will be revealed in an audit is going to be dependent upon the number of people that work within the organization. Also the time, I mean, it's, it's so much, but to each his own. And again, if budget constraints um, are a real issue, there are tools that are able, that are, that are usable, um, that will not tap into, um, you know, pulling any further resources. And so, just take a deep dive, see what you have the capacity to do. Also mm -hmm. recognize that audits can reveal different things. Now you say compensation, but compensation can even be dissected even more, sure. right? Are we talking about compensation as it relates to women? Are we talking to compensation as it relates to women in their 30s and their 40s? Are we talking about compensation as it relates to graduate degrees? Like it's so much, but to get a broad, view of your organization is at least the first step and that can happen internal in-house as well. Wonderful. Thank you for that. You know, at the at the end you started going expert level on us with <laughs> but that just goes to show that there are so many nuances to it, right? And things to yes. be considered as we're thinking about all of the different components. So this is a recurring theme. I, we we're consistently saying don't ask the questions that you're not prepared to do something with the answer. So Angela, once we've conducted the audit, tell us what that deliverable stage looks like. Tell us what what do we we do with the findings once we have age capacity and we've gotten the information now what do we do
do with it. Okay, so yet again, you have to act. Um, so employees, employees are leery of employers who collect information and then don't do anything with it. It actually erodes trust. Your failure to act will erode the trust um, with your employees. And so once you get the information from these audits, you want to prioritize eliminating pay inequities be transparent about publishing pay ranges for each role because that lets people know what they can expect in a particular position. And as we all know, you can't prevent employees from talking about their salaries in the workplace. And so you probably will, should expect that they're sharing that information and that can create a whole other dynamic that you may not wanna deal with. But if you're publishing those ranges and being transparent, there's no surprises. As it relates to performance management, you want to develop a performance review process that's equitable for everybody. You want to give substantive comments to support any ratings that you're giving. Uh, the employees and the supervisors should partner on establishing their goals so that there's an understanding of those performance expectations. And, and very important is that you train your supervisors on how to deliver unbiased performance management throughout the course of the year. So those are, I think, some of the things that I think that you would do once you learn uh, what your issues are from the audits. Right. So, so what I'm hearing is that the audit is just the first step. You've got a whole lot of work to do once the audit is complete. And that audit is really creating sort of the work plan for how you're moving forward. And you really do use the information coming out of that for any manner of things, training, revamping processes and, and all of that. Thanks so much for that, Angela. Mm -hmm. So Michael. How have you seen some of these inequities that, you know, no matter how hard we try, sometimes we don't do it soon enough. We don't do it often enough, right? How often have you seen some, how have you seen some of these inequities affect an organization's recruitment strategy? Sure. Well, I, so one thing Angela just touched on that I want to expand on a little bit is if you as an organization are afraid to post your salary range on your job description, then you have an equity problem with your compensation. It, it's, yeah. it's as simple as that. So I, I probably spend an embarrassing amount of time on Reddit and TikTok these days. Uh, and I follow a few different subreddits related to recruiting and, and kind of the candidate experience, which is a nice pro tip if you're a recruiter yourself. Um, and griping about employers not, in posting, not posting a salary range on a job post is absolutely becoming a meme trend. Um, and, and as we all know, once Generation Z has called something out via meme, it's going to become a cultural expectation pretty that's soon. It. So that's mm -hmm. happening. Um, so if you're not doing it, you really need to engage with, should you be doing it? Um, and then as Brian said, you know, candidates are paying attention to their total compensation. So really think about what you have going for you and what you don't have going for you as an organization and brag about what you're great at, what you have going for you and address what you don't. I and mean, we're all nonprofits, or not everyone, but a lot of the organizations on this call are nonprofits and you know, not our nonprofits aren't always able to lead the way in terms of monetary compensation, but what else are they able to offer? Their mission focus, so leaning into why employees uh, choose to work for your organization, uh, remote work versus in-person work, uh, you know, is that is that something that's a strength? Is that something that's a weakness when it comes to uh, uh, to attracting candidates? Um, those are some of the thoughts that I have about, um, about yeah, about inequity with recruiting strategy. Absolutely. Thanks and so Mark, much for that, Michael. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry, Brian. To expand upon um, Michael and, and so said this yesterday, um, even if again you don't have the compensation to be able to 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 do all of these wonderful things, something as small as having a dress down policy uh, could be the difference between a person being able to come in and be their authentic self um, or not. And so um, there's also wellness um, wellness um, doors that you can open up and giving thirty you know giving people thirty minutes a day mm -hmm. just to start the internet. Right. We, you know, we, we think of these things being very small, but that 30 minutes could be used to go pick up a child or to make a doctor's appointment for a child. Like, and these are things that can impact the culture of an organization. And it's not based in compensation. It's just based in I see you as a person and I want you to have the time to be who you are. That's right. And, you know, speaking to what you just mentioned, Brian, I actually was negotiating um, a compensation package for a candidate recently, and uh, she said, I will accept this salary if there is flexibility in the work schedule, because then I don't have to pay for before and after care for my son. 
There you go. And uh, in thinking about, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we have parents on the call. And so in thinking about how ex how much more expensive the, the 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. hour and the 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. hours are uh, in, in child care versus that core eight to four hours is probably more significant than anything that this potential employer could have even added to the salary of the candidate, the prospective candidate. And it didn't cost them anything to make it so that she could take time off early in the morning or in the after, late in the afternoon and not have to have this added expense of extended care for her child. So that's just an, uh, just an example of how you can create equity within your compensation. That's not gonna cost you any money, right? It's really just, and again, you don't know if these types of things are affecting or could be valuable to your staff if you don't ask the questions. And the great way to ask the questions are through these types of audits and surveys that will really create an open forum for feedback so that you know that the benefits structure and the total reward structure that you come up is really relevant and valuable to the team that you have working for you. So I love how all of this is coming full circle. I'll pause here. Atokatha, do we have answers to our question um, about compensation structure? When is the last time your organization audited their compensation structure? We do, Myra, and the vast majority of people said either yearly or every few years. Um, most people who put something in said that they are actively auditing. Um, there's okay. one that I wanted to share with you, and it is, we did a study on the market to see where we fell with salary ranges about two years ago due to increase in external funding. We were able to give everyone an increase by $5,000 this okay. fiscal year. That's fantastic. I'm sure that your staff really appreciated that, the, not only the exercise of conducting the audit, but the response to the audit is really where the value in that story is, is the response. And that's, that's really fantastic. Were there any questions at this point that we can cover before we move on to the next part? Yes, Myra, there were, um, especially around the compensation study. And, and one in particular was around just not having one. And where does the organization start? One person said, we're embarrassed to say that we don't have one, but it sounds like they're looking for some information. Absolutely. Well, the first place I'm going to go, and you know, I don't want to be trite with my answer, but Nonprofit HR has a fantastic total rewards team. And our total rewards team, I don't want to say they specialize in compensation studies because that implies that that's all they do. Um, but they are experts in conducting compensation analyses and uh, studies for the full organization, whether you have three employees or 3,000. Um, our team is, stands at the ready to be able to respond and then also um, help you with setting up a structure for ongoing reviews of your compensation structure. And so if you wouldn't mind just reaching out to us, we can definitely connect you with our total rewards team who will in the and at the most immediate step really be able to hear what your needs are, provide some insight for what immediate next steps could be, and if it makes sense for everyone, really move forward with actually conducting that analysis. Another question, Atokatha, are we ready to move on? Uh, yes, we. I think we should move on. Okay, perfect, sounds good. All right, so we've got our final question for the audience ready to go up. Uh, and the final question that you all will respond to is what elements would you consider when surveying your staff on their feelings of belonging? So we're gonna talk a little bit now about essential tips on how to create a culture of belonging that aligns with your commitment to DEI and career campaigns. I'll also let you know that following this set of interaction with our panelists here, we will be moving into our formal Q&A um, portion of the program. So if you wanna get your questions geared up for anything at all that we've discussed at this point, up until this point during the presentation, please go ahead and pop them in the chat and we'll pause after this section to get those questions answered and we'll use the rest of our time together to do that. Uh, so I'll start with you, Sophia. What strategies can an organization use to foster feelings of belonging throughout the career continuum? So that's from onboard through the recruitment process, onboarding through 20-year tenure. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Um, I always like to just first start with what is easiest um, and then most accessible for everyone. Literally just asking sometimes without having a follow up work request. How are you feeling or in my words, how are you vibrating? Um, mm. Really just leaving your culture to be a space of like empathy building. And also when you're having conversation in meetings and just in conversation, removing exclusion, um, exclusion vocabulary. So like really try to be more sensitive and um, forward thinking in how you're talking and making sure that everyone kind of knows what words are more culturally um, sensitive and focused. Um, and then I would also recommend, I know we're supposed to be talking about what we're supposed to do, but I think it's always important to kind of move away from some things sometimes if you need to. I think we are at a place where people should move away from like cultural potlucks and holiday gatherings as being your only form of gathering together. Um, you're really play, placing a lot of individuals in a situation of having to either decide, do I want to celebrate something that I don't actually celebrate and recognize so that I can be this employee who is able to show up and engage? And I don't think that that should be how we make our only form of communication um, with our colleagues when it comes from non-work related things. One thing that I definitely encourage and like to see is focus driven activities. So having an activity that might um, come along with your mission. Um, nonprofit HR, clearly we service nonprofit organizations. So having a community service event collectively together where everyone is just going out and doing something um, that is different from our actual work pace um, is always interesting. Um, also thinking about having activities that actually take you out of the building. Like yeah. many times when people have those potlucks or anything that is like, oh, we're going to do something around lunch. If you have a group of individuals that are working and literally like feel like, okay, well, I'm here and I need to be doing this because we're at work. You haven't removed me from the office for two to four hours to actually allow me to get a change of pace. You just put something on the calendar for 45 minutes. You haven't really given that person an opportunity to disconnect. And I think it's important to disconnect away from work um, when we're thinking about how can we foster belonging amongst each other, because you want to get the opportunity to actually get to know your colleagues um, in a way that's so comfortable for even the introverts and the extroverts, because introverts don't always sit in the office and want to do small talk. Right. There needs to be something that is a focus of a mission driven purpose for an introvert to normally feel comfortable stepping outside of what they're doing. Um, and then also we have a lot of organizations that are currently moving towards having affinity groups. And I think that that's a really great idea. Um, in these affinity groups, you're allowing individuals to get together based on their shared experiences. You can set up any type of structure or rules or policies, not that you know rules and policies should be like how we do everything, but you can set up some guidance around it that says like whatever the shared experiences are here are not to be discussed outside of this group, but allowing individuals to have an outlet that is not work related. And I think the key here for belonging is knowing that we do have one collective thing that is bringing together and that is us working on projects that we might be doing together or, you know, things of involving professionalism. But to feel a sense of belonging, sometimes it is important to walk away from the work driven activity of it and allow people to just be themselves. And then you will have a culture where individuals are able and feel safe and comfortable to show up as their full self during their professional hours. That's so good, Sophia. And you know, I am, um, I love the ability to just with all of the interaction that we have with different clients, just picking up the, just developing a sense for what the fullness of diversity is and you bringing up the introvert versus the extrovert is a diversity that we do not commonly think about right we're always talking about ways to engage and putting each other in each other in, in one another's faces and talking and and the introverts are like who said I wanted to talk to you <laughs> right <laughs> or you know and and who said that I needed to be more involved and that's just something else that we really need to be thinking about when we're thinking about how people are feeling like they belong. Are we just asking the extroverts how they feel of when belonging? Or do we need to also reevaluate some of these opportunities and making sure that whether someone considers themselves an introvert, an extrovert, or an ambivert is a new one that I heard, right? That we really do have space for everyone, right? And that everyone does feel like they belong. Thank you so much for those insights.
Now, Michael, what I'd love to do is drive this back toward the recruitment process. What questions are candidates asking about the, uh, belonging, right? DEI and, and the B, right? How is it affecting their decisions to join an organization or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that's a question because we get asked that all the time as recruiters and interviewers. And so one thing I would definitely say is as an organization, make sure that all your hiring plant managers and interviewers feel prepared to answer this very question, which I'll talk about in a little bit more in a second. But it will get asked and having an interviewer saying, well, that's not really my thing or that's not, that's not really my job is not going to go over well. So make Wrong sure answer. that this is something. Yeah. Your interviewers need to be engaged with your company, your organizational culture as it relates to DE&I and um, B. So um, in terms of uh, the types of questions to help uh, that candidates will ask, first of all, they want to know who they're going to be interacting with and who at your organization is going to be invested in them. And they have a variety of ways to ask this, but, you know, they... That, that's that's exactly why having diverse leadership is so so important because candidate all most candidates especially diverse candidates are looking at your staff page and thinking who at this organization is going to be my mentor who's going to have my back who's going to be interested in development in my development who's going to inspire me at this organization and so they're going to ask you questions related to that um, so a lot of this really comes down to promoting and hiring diverse staff in your senior leadership level positions not just um, at the bottom of your org chart. So that's critically important. Um, you're also looking at, is there a disconnect between who you say you're hiring and who appears on your staff page and in your social media? We've touched a little bit on that, but they're going to be figuring out ways to get that information from you yeah. because that's really important to candidates as they're evaluating their job. Also, we should probably all say this, this is, an, this is a job candidates market right now. There's a lot of people looking for jobs and especially as more organizations are pivoting to remote work, there's, they have a lot of opportunities out there. So um, they have, they're going to have, they're going to be evaluating you just like you're evaluating them. Mm -hmm. um, one other point here is um, they want to know that what makes them unique won't simply be tolerated by your organization, mm -hmm. but that it's going to be championed. They're going to really want to think about what is their experience going to be like once they're working at your organization and are they going to be valued for whatever traits they have that make them unique and make them, you know, an individual. Um, and then finally, they're going to ask about professional development. Um, and that doesn't just mean, am I going to get prov promoted quickly? That's not necessarily what that could, they could mean that a little bit, but that's not just what they're looking at. They're really looking at making sure that staff employees um, have resources to be able to regularly engage with and improve their comp cultural competency and, and really develop as professionals while employed at your organization. So those are a lot of the types of questions that you're going to you're going to see from candidates. Thank you for that, Michael. Thank you so much. And Brian, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen organizations reaffirm their commitment to belonging? Absolutely. I've seen organizations empower their staff to create internal DEI committees, um, and they've provided them with real power and not just performative tasks. Um, I've also seen organizations consider, um, and, and Sophia um, mentioned this, Affinity groups, um, affinity groups that staff want to see. Um, I've seen a particular organization have an affinity group for new fathers. Um, mm -hmm. This is that is wow. not often discussed and or talk. I started it. <laughs> 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 uh, this was something at which um, you know we actually had men come and, and just engage about their experience with work-life balance and coming home and not knowing how to be a dad, but knowing that they have. 30 emails that they have to send. And it was just wow, yeah. a great group. Um, engage in coffee. And I put air quotes around tea chats. Not everybody drinks coffee. You have mm -hmm. my, 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 my mother-in-law um, is Indian and she loves tea. And that's a way to bring cultures in because if you have a culture that only engage, that engages with tea more than coffee, that opens up the door. And Absolutely. so you want to be as small as that. I've also seen organizations partner with other organizations. Right. And it's just a simple way of just being able to bridge two organizations together to be able to throw best practices, to be able to engage with, um, you know, DEI strategies that are working for your organization that could also work within our organization. Um, I've also seen organizations revamp their outward facing public statement to DEI practices and update them with more current language. Um, we've all seen statements um, that are the flavor of the day. Mm -hmm. and easily pick those out and so can candidates 
Um, utilize social media, and, and, and Michael spoke to this, um, utilize social media, but not just in a way to pander. If the only time I see people of color on your social media is around Indigenous People's Day, I, I already know. Mm -hmm. Already. Um, do activities um, with the individuals that you are on a journey on. And I'm not saying these are the people that you serve, right? Because you don't serve anybody. But the people that you are on a journey on, engage your staff with being able to go out and meet the people. Yeah. Because they, their story becomes a story of mission driven and why they do what they do. And just a couple of more. Um, really look at your mentoring and mentee programming. Train the mentors to be mentors, get that cultural competence in, allow for them to be able to identify fun ways to engage and review body language as a form of communication and things of that nature, because you want to allow for the people within your organization to be able to be authentic, to be vulnerable so that they can impart what they need into someone that they trust so that they can improve on um, the, the outcomes of work. And last but not least, I think this is one of the most important when you engage with vendors, make sure that they are diverse. Don't continue to go to the same restaurant for the catered lunch. Um, start to look and see who is out there that represents a different population um, and provide them with some, with some support and some, and some businesses as well. Um, we also have to remember too that we are in many cases remote and we are going to remain remote very long or for, for an extended period of time. So how do you develop a culture of belonging behind a computer? And mm. some of the ways being able to do that is essentially some of the things that we are talking about now. When you let the staff know that their lunch is going to be catered to them delivery style and they can get whatever they want from wherever they want, that's diversity, right? Yeah. That's what you do that can make someone happy instead of the same Panera bread sandwiches. Nothing against Panera, but I you, you, say. you all know what I mean. Um, but yeah, there are some things that you can do. And if you look at everything that was shared, some of these are free and mm -hmm. some of them are a reduced cost that can go a very long way. Thank you for that, Brian. And Angela, I just want to give you an opportunity to add any tips that you may uh, have for an organization who's just starting this journey. You know, they joined the webinar today because we've, we recognize that our commitment is just starting and we're looking for some ideas around how to begin with the, our journey on belonging. Okay. And so the first step is always going to be, you have to figure out where you are to know where you're going to go. So evaluate your landscape and see what's actually going on in your organization as it relates to your talent acquisition practices, but also all of the other things that we've talked about today. And as you gather that feedback, you want to use the feedback that you're getting to build a more inclusive environment. So if you need to adjust your policies, then do that. If you need to reimagine some practices that you're doing, then do those things. And then finally, specific to talent acquisition, you want to think about your approach to talent acquisition and then design a playbook that has an equity lens to it. So those kinds of things would have a recruitment processes and workflow section, um, the building the talent pipeline and sourcing candidates, and then also looking for where you can find those diverse candidates as part of that piece of the, of the playbook. Thinking about DEI considerations in the talent acquisition process, things like the, the blind resume review and things like that. And then the best practices for the hiring manager as it relates to recruiting. So that would be things like, how do you put together the interview panel? Um, you know, how are you scoring your candidates? Things like that. So I think that those are probably the best ways to, to get started on this piece. Thanks so much for that, Angela. So before we wrap up, we've got about 10 minutes here. Atokatha, let's answer some of those questions. And first, let's hear if there were any answers to our question about what elements would you consider when serving your staff on their feelings of belonging, and then let's get those questions answered with the time that we have left. Uh, okay, you wanna switch to the, just one second. So someone said, uh, we have great places to work, um, a great places to work annual survey. They have provided some great resources in terms of how to improve areas of concern. We usually choose three areas as an organization and three areas as a department. By creating focus groups or open discussions, we are able to solicit information directly from employees and get buy-in on certain ideas at, that percolate. Wonderful. Fantastic. 
uh, that was one of the thoughts regarding affinity groups. Here's another. Our organization has affinity groups. We also have cultural book clubs um, to offer safe and transparent discussion. Um, there are a few questions in here. Okay. You said there are well. not? There are a few questions oh. in here as well. Uh, okay. So one is, okay, uh, can you speak to the connections you have seen between affinity groups and DEI committees groups? How and how one might create a pipeline and feed into another? Also, when you speak about those groups having power, what has that looked like? Have you seen that done successfully? Brian, would you like to take the question on the power that you've seen those affinity groups, how you create it and how you've seen it sort of play out? Absolutely. So I've seen groups, I've seen some groups um, create internal surveys um, to really get information just about the climate, right? That's not going to be something that goes against HR. Um, they've also asked questions about ways to be able to be more inclusive, what type of affinity groups they would like to see within the organization. And with them being created by that committee and being disseminated by that committee and then that information being aggregated by that committee, that was transformative because then they were spokes and spokesmen and women um, for that group, for the larger organization. I've also seen them look at the handbook. I've also seen them um, engage with um, just more recently an organization that I was working with um, before Juneteenth became an official federal, federal holiday. Um, there was already, um, you know, there was, they had a, a document already put forth to make that um, a holiday for their organization. And so that's the power um, that, that I am talking about. But I've also seen the inverse where it's been, um, you know what, find some, find some books um, that you think that we should be reading once a month, uh, find a TED talk, uh, talk to us about it at the next meeting. Oh, we don't have time for the next meeting. So go ahead and email it to us. Mm. That's, that's the worst um, because then it just, those committed individuals start to then lose trust in the work, but also within the organization. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, that's it. The trust factor is so huge. Atoko, there you'd mentioned there's one more question. Yes, Myra. I know a best practice can be to remove identifying information on resumes to address bias. That can happen. But often when we are recruiting for diversity, leaving the information on is one of the main ways we can distinguish people of the global majority we want to hire. Do you have any thoughts about this? So the first question I would ask is, how are you able to distinguish someone who is a part of the global majority by their resume? Um, right. and, and, and letting you know up front that that already is the wrong way to approach identification. The only way that you can determine whether someone is a part of the global majority or minority is if they self-identify. You can't just look at someone or use clues on a piece of paper to, paper to determine that. So let's dispel that piece of it first. What we are doing by removing identifiable information or potentially identifiable information is anyone that already has a bias that would come up based upon a name that they see or a school that a person has attended or you know just the career trajectory, the area of town that they happen to live in and all of the rest of those pieces because you really do need to give people an opportunity to self-identify and that is how you can really gauge the, the health of your, the diversity of your pipeline. It's only by self-identification. And if a person chooses not to, it's just not information that you have and you have to move forward. The other piece of it, though, and someone asked this question earlier, um, is about, you know, how how you can reaffirm your commitment to diversity in a position description without actually saying we want to hire diverse candidates. And so. I think this entire group can say that we want to dispel the myth that hiring for diversity means hiring black or brown people. Hiring for diversity means that you end up with a, a workforce that is representative of the fullness of the earth. 
Okay. And so as you are hiring someone, as you are hiring people, you are looking to make sure that you have broadened the landscape of your recruitment platform to include everyone. So we're not trying to create an opposite problem where now white people are not being hired anymore because everyone has moved to a place of only hiring uh, people who identify as what we are considering minorities. And so the idea here is for you to create equitable hiring practices so that your hiring practices are based solely in the competencies that are required for the work. If you focus on those competencies and you cast the broad net, the diversity will happen. Once you identify the commitment to diversity, once you live the principles around hiring and recruiting for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you create the narrative and the employer brand to support it, all of the diversity will happen. That it goes like, but the problem there is that there's no shortcut to it. You have to actually live it. You have to actually be doing it. You actually have to take the journey in order for those things to happen. I'm going to pause there because I see lots of shaking heads on my screen and I want to make sure everyone else can contribute. Well, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head when I was hearing like by looking at someone's name, um, you know, I could certainly just marry someone who has a name and take that name. You have no idea who I am. And we should never, ever get in the habit of identity, identifying people for themselves. They should be self-identifying what diversity they have, what traits that they have. Um, and I definitely think that um, using your applicant tracking systems, depending on if you have that, is one way to collect that uh, demographic information that you want. And you can usually align that um, what dimensions of diversity, be it the veteran status or the age or the race, you can align those things with who the candidates are. And that's going to help you see what your applicant pool actually looks like and help you make those determinations about whether or not you need to pause this recruitment, cast a wide or net, or you can keep going because you have enough diversity in your pool. And I'd just add on to that beyond, you know, applicant tracking tools that may, you know, remove personally identifi identifiable information, all that. Once you get into the hiring process itself, there's so many things that you can do to remove opportunities for bias. One would be not having, I've seen organizations where they have the same interviewer kind of escort the candidate through multiple interviews and, and then they just frame the entire interview. They're like, oh, you're gonna love this candidate. Here's X, Y, and Z. Why don't you tell them? You know, that, that's just ripe for opportunities for bias. Um, similarly, if you have interviews with just one interviewer, there's, there's so much more opportunity to bring your personal biases into play. When you're the only person, you have no one to check against. Um, so having interviews with two or three different interviewers in the same interview process. And then one last one would be using evaluation forms to ground the interviewer. So actually having, you know, grounding them back in, here's the competencies that we set out to evaluate our candidates on. So immediately during or after the interview, looking at that evaluation form and, and really evaluating the candidate based on the competencies that you've identified in advance, not just your gut feel or your read based on the interview. Absolutely. And, you know, we're ready to wrap up here. And thank you all so much for your time today. There was one final question that was submitted ahead of time that I just want to take 10 seconds to address. Um, and the question was, is the lack of diverse qualified candidates a myth or reality? And I want to tell you, and I can speak for all five of us on this call, we do not need to do a round robin. It is 100% a myth. The only thing that diverse candidates are lacking is opportunity. And that's the last thing that I think I want to leave you all with. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today. That's all good. I'll kick it back off to you to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Myra. That's all the time we have for Q&A. Thank you to our entire panelist. We hope you found the information shared today valuable. Uh, you may uh, look forward to receiving the recording to this webinar and also slides in the coming days. Uh, there are many more webinars coming up in 2021. Feel free to visit nonprofithr.com forward slash events to see those uh, webinars and to register. Also, please be sure to complete the feedback survey that will pop up once the webcast has ended. Your comments help us with our planning and can inform the topics we cover as well. If you'd like more information about the services that Nonprofit HR provides and also Impact Search Advisors by Nonprofit HR provides, please send us an email at info at nonprofithr.com or visit us online at nonprofithr.com. Thank you so much again for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day.